as he is the Chief of Pediatric Hematology Oncology at Chance, and it is with great honor that I allow him to start us off for the night. Well, thank you very much. Can everybody hear me? Yep. Okay. I have some slides that should be in the slide deck there. So I wanted to tell you all a story of a patient that I think is an amazing story and it exemplifies how uh, our patients benefit from an uh, interdisciplinary team of, of people and a, a large team of people who take care of them as they go through their journey of treatment for cancer. So this is little Aiden. And Aiden was a healthy two-year-old when he developed um, an illness where he became very, very lethargic. And his mom ended up taking him to the emergency room in Tallahassee where um, he was actually very, very, very sick. Um, and um, go ahead to the next slide, please. In the ER, um, there was a whole slew of people who worked with uh, Aiden, um, including uh, the, the, the clerk who, who uh, checked him in, the triage nurse, the staff nurse there, uh, the physician who saw him, and uh, the people who transported him to, uh, to get some imaging. And so they did some imaging of Aiden's head uh, and they found that he had a number of small bleeds in his head. And in fact, he, um, he had a really, really high white count, a white count of over a million cells. Uh, it should be down below 10,000. Um, and uh, he was found to have T-cell leukemia um, he was brought to the University of Florida by air ambulance, and there was a pilot and a nurse who uh, uh, picked him up from TMH and brought him safely to our center, where he checked into the ER there, and um, again, uh, met a whole team of, uh, of people who um, brought him to a room uh, there were three doctors who saw him in that room from my team, but at the time he had signs that uh, there was a lot of pressure on his brain and that it was causing this thing called herniation, which is where the brainstem is getting compressed. So he was taken down to for another CT scan, which confirmed that he was herniating and then he was brought up to the ICU. In the ICU, he was met by a team of doctors, by a respiratory therapist, uh, by the pediatric surgeons, by the pediatric neurosurgeons. And we all worked very diligently to stabilize Aiden because he was in the process of dying from this bleed that was in his head. Um, the neurosurgeons ended up removing a window of bone from the front of his skull. Um, anesthesia, the anesthesia team ended up intubating him and put him on a ventilator where they, um, they had him breathing really quickly, which helped bring the pressure down also in his brain. And, um, and then we sent his blood to hematopathology where a technician ran it through a uh, machine called a flow cytometer. And then the hematopathologist confirmed for us that he had T-cell leukemia. And so we started his therapy that night. But just the process of bringing him into the medical system, he probably encountered about 30 or 40 different people who were helping him in some way um, uh, get to the process of making the diagnosis and stabilizing him. So let's move to the next slide. So these are the, the various people 
who uh, worked with Aiden while he was recovering from from uh, his his brain bleed, the people in the intensive care unit, pediatric neurosurgery, the oncology team. He eventually um, came off the ventilator and he was brought down to unit 42 where a lot of the streetlight volunteers work. I mean, a lot of the footprints volunteers work uh, where he encountered the nursing staff there, the child life specialist, a phlebotomist, uh, pediatric neuropsychology. These are people who map the brains of children who've had brain injuries. We had our pediatric pharmacist who helped us uh, design his tre treatment plan and the pediatric uh, social workers who helped his mom who had to, to essentially um, uh, live in Gainesville for the next two to three months. And then of course, Footprints was there to help mom uh, and, and work with him so that mom could get some breaks. Next slide. So this is a picture of Aiden during his treatment. And Aiden um, is wearing the helmet. He's wearing the helmet because now he has this little window of bone cut out from his skull. And his twin sister is next to him. And you can see that she's growing a little bit faster than he is because he's on chemotherapy. And that's his older brother. And uh, um, during his treatment, you know, Aiden thrived, but Aiden had to come to our clinic uh, to get his chemotherapy. He would get chemotherapy and we'd also put chemotherapy into his spinal fluid through this reservoir called an Omaya reservoir, which was up in his scalp. Um, and that was to keep the leukemia from coming back in his brain. And he continued to get chemotherapy for the next uh, two and a half years, coming back and forth, um, getting therapy in our infusion center. Next slide. So these are, are the people who cared for Aiden during that period. He would go to neurosurgery clinic. There were checking up staff, the nurses' positions. He had pediatric physical and occupational therapy. He went to ophthalmology clinic because he had had a hemorrhage in his eye. Um, and then he would come to uh, the oncology clinic, unit 41. You know, there's a number of staff who work there. Um, and then um, there were students, residents, fellows, and attendings from my team who would work with him. He would go to pediatric cardiology to get echocardiograms because some of the medicines affect the heart. And of course, child life and footprints were still, you know, intimately integrated into his care. The next uh, slide. So after two and a half years of therapy, uh, Aiden finished and he, he ended up having his end of therapy ceremony where we sing for him and we, we have him ring a bell uh, to, to signify the end of his therapy. And you, you can see some of my staff with him on that day. We, we, we give him a little uh, diploma and we give him a little toy and a, a trophy for uh, going through his therapy. Next slide. But even after his therapy was over, there were still things that needed to be done. He was still wearing a helmet because he had that window in his skull and they had to replace the bone. So he came back in the hospital and um, he uh, underwent a surgery to replace that bone. So let's just look at the team of people who work with him then. So, you know, his surgery entailed uh, getting checked in to the operating room. He worked with the PACU nurses. He had an OR scrub tech who was in there handing the surgeon tools. Um, he had a pediatric plastic surgery resident fellow in attending who worked with him, and then a recovery room nurse. And then once his surgery was over, he went up to unit 44 where child life was there. There was a clerk, there were all the nurses. And then of course, Footprints was also there to help him out. Next slide. This is a picture of him immediately post-op 
plastic surgery did a beautiful job putting this bone back in. And, you know, you can hardly tell that he's had a surgery because all of the, all the sutures are at his scalp line. Next slide. And so now he's in his follow-up care. Uh, he comes to Tallahassee to see me at the, our Tallahassee clinic because this is where he lives. So we have our nursing staff here. There's an ARNP that usually joins me. I'm actually here in Tallahassee right now staffing our clinic. Um, and there's, uh, you know, there's a attending physician, a nurse, and a check-in staff here. He goes and sees his primary care physician, and there's all the office staff there. He goes to a school where there's a school nurse. And then there in, in his community, there's a group called the Hank Tuff House that provides um, support for people with chronic illness, and uh, they support families like, like Aiden's. Next slide. So Aiden is now three years off therapy and he's doing fine. And in fact, um, the Gators actually honored him at one of the football games. This is one of the players who came, you know, the players, when they introduced him, they were standing by and then they came and run ran over and gave him a high five. And um, I think one of them actually gave him his little hairband and stuff. And you can see this is him with the, with the funny um, gator shades. He is a gator fan in spite of, of living in Tallahassee and there's his family. And you know, you can see he's, he's doing really great. So I, I think the point that I wanna make here is that it takes a lot of teamwork to get uh, a kid like Aiden through his treatment. And one of the points of this forum is for people from Footprints to learn about all of the different roles a person can play in making somebody get well. And you can see that everybody who moved him, everybody who played with him, um, everybody who touched him in surgery, they all had a role. Um, and so, you know, great medical care is a team sport. And I just want to finish by saying that I think Aiden um, is a wonderful kid and he has a great story. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Slayton, for coming and sharing Aiden's story. Um, but I know that touched me. I know that touched all of you guys as well. And I especially appreciate how you encompass the goal of this forum, which is to highlight all the different providers and aspects of healthcare that go into treating a pediatric patient. So thank you once again. Um, and then next we have Ms. Ferretti, who will be discussing her work as a pediatric hematology and oncology social worker. I can pass it on to you, Ms. Ferretti, whenever you're ready. Hey everyone, can you hear me? Yep. Okay, perfect. Hi guys, my name is Francesca Ferretti. I am a licensed clinical social worker and I primarily cover the hematology and oncology service at UF Health Shands. Um, in Pete's Hemoc, we have um, broken down our coverage into services. So my services primarily cover um, pediatric leukemia, lymphoma, and benign heme. Um, a fun fact about me actually um, is that when I was an undergrad at UF, I was a volunteer um, with, within the child life department. So that's kind of how I started my journey in healthcare was um, becoming a volunteer on the pediatrics unit um, on Gen Peds, then a PCA, and then um, I ended up going into social work as my career. Um, so, you know, as a volunteer, you really get a sense of like the hospital system and you get immersed in all different types of specialties. So it's a great way to learn, especially if that's something you're interested in going to school for. Um, my role as a social worker can be very different, um, especially I'm like very specialized in my role. Um, in general, uh, you'll see social workers play various roles. I kind of take on that more general pediatric social worker role on the weekends where um, I'm tending to emergencies in the ER um, for like burns, uh, child abuse, neglect assessments, um, trauma, um, end of life kind of cases, um, Baker Act referrals, 
So there's a myriad of all different types of consults that social work um, will come across with. And so depending on the pediatric floor that you're at, you're going to have some kind of cases that are heavy versus others. Um, I'll go more in specific detail of my particular role, like Monday through Friday, what I do. So, um, you know, I work in an interdisciplinary team setting and, you know, part of my role is to try to help the patient and family adjust to the new diagnosis and basically walk them through their entire treatment process. So I follow patients from the beginning of diagnosis through active treatment um, to end of therapy or even survivorship or relapse or end of life. So I follow them throughout the whole their whole disease journey, both inpatient and outpatient setting. So um, my role, like I really get to know these patients and families. And so I step in in many different ways. I wear many different hats because um, each patient and family are very different. No one fits into one particular box. So um, my roles for different families, I mean, my roles can vary even with the patient and the family. You know, some families may need more financial support. Others may not need the financial support, but, but may need the emotional support. So I have to like meet the patient and family where they're at and try to assist as needed. Um, you know, some of my roles include, you know, just helping the families process the diagnosis and also, you know, helping them to formulate a plan because the doctor will come in and tell them that they have a new diagnosis and then the family's life is just turned upside down. And so often I'm having to come in to problem solve with the family. Um, oftentimes parents need to adjust their treatment or adjust their work schedule or even quit their job, you know, to be the caregiver for their child or um, helping them problem solve to navigate. How do you, how does one take, parent take care of one patient while there's other siblings at home? And so I'm usually like helping to write letters for the work, um, for the employers so that the parents can uh, take the time off to take care for their children. Um, also with our kids, a lot of our kids who get chemo are immunosuppressed and so they're not allowed to go to school. So I tend to help coordinate hospital homebound and work on that paperwork to ensure that the kid is still able to receive their education despite not being able to be in an in-person classroom setting. And, you know, like cancer affects families, no matter what, no matter what your socioeconomic status is. So even if, you know, we have Medicaid patients, um, they might need some support with um, regular household bills, utilities and whatnot, but also even those with private insurance too, they get slapped with co-pays and costs for medications. And so I'm, I'm constantly helping everyone trying to, um, be fair in my resources, but also trying to assess and see what is needed per each family, um, just because they're they're so different. And so um, there are a lot of like wonderful organizations, both um, local and national that I tap into that really like take care of the concrete needs um, so that the patient and family can focus on each other and the parents can focus on the child. You know, the last thing I want a parent to worry about is how are they gonna pay their electric bill tomorrow? You know, so I kind of step in and try to assist as needed um, so that they can focus on their child. And also um, really, you know, like the basic needs, the hierarchy of needs, how can you focus on processing the emotional impact of having your child have a cancer if you are worried about your water turning off the next day. So, you know, in order to target the basic needs, if I can help that or eliminate some of those barriers, then I can focus more deeply on how the family is functioning and coping. So it really spans, you know, 
um, a variety of different things. You know, sometimes I have kids that come in and they're uninsured. So I'm helping them navigate through governmental systems, um, getting them connected through hospital programs or even governmental programs such as like Medicaid and SSI. And so, you know, um, I also assist with medication coordination for those that um, when their insurance doesn't cover their medication or if they don't have insurance, I'm, I'm working in the back end to make sure that the kids get the treatment that they need. Um, I provide a psychosocial assessment. They do a very thorough assessment upon meeting every new diagnosis just to target and see how I can best support the family. And so I'm really, really getting to know their family, their support system, um, because, you know, Dr. Slayton and the whole entire team, they're not going to be able to treat the patient if, they, if the parents can't even bring the patient to the hospital. So I'm working on, you know, eliminating transportation barriers or implementing and helping them find ways to get to treatment. Also, we have a lot of kids that come, you know, sometimes air flighted or come from the Panhandle, South Georgia, several hours away. And so part of my role too is to help um, patients and fi families find local lodging for a period of time so that their kids can receive treatment. So um, really all in all, I do a whole vast array of of things within my job. Um, I feel like, you know, I can have questions come to me about insurance, about financial resources, about coping. So it really just depends. It, it varies per person. I did provide my um, specific email address just because I cover so many things that if you guys have any um, particular questions, feel free to email me because I'm more than happy to um, try to answer any specific questions that you have. Um, you know, all in all, I mean, as a social worker, as working in an interdisciplinary team, everyone plays a vital role, even you guys, because um, you provide a lot of relief for us, um, knowing that like, these kids, sometimes parents can't be at bedside and they have to work. And so having you there um, to be of support to these patients and these parents really, really make a big impact. And I wanna thank all of you for um, becoming a Footprints volunteer because you really do make a difference as well. And you are a part of our team. Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing that with us, Ms. Freddie. It always means a lot to hear um, what Footprints gets to do with the kids, but also um, very meaningful to hear all about the different work you do for the families there and all those different considerations that need to be made when providing medical care. So that was excellent. Thank you so much. Thank you. So next up, we have Dr. Abu Sawa, who will be describing her work as a pediatric pharmacist at Shan's Children's Hospital. So let's go ahead and give it up for her. Hello everyone. Um, so uh, thank you, Madison, for the introduction. So um, I am um, uh, presenting from Chicago. I'm currently at a conference, so bear with me, but there's a lovely view of uh, some of the Chicago skyline behind me. Um, so as Madison said, um, I'm Dr. Obusawa. I'm a uh, pharmacist at uh, UF Health. Um, and I'm really thankful for uh, being able to speak to you all. Um, and I, you know, would like to tell you a little bit about um, what I do as a pediatric pharmacist, um, but then also leave some time to answer any questions that you guys might have. Um, so uh, next slide, please. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about my journey because, um, you know, just, just to kind of give you guys an idea of what uh, pharmacy entails and what um, it takes to become a pediatric pharmacist. So um, like many of you, I actually went to undergrad here at UF. Um, and like the previous speaker, actually, when I was here in undergrad, I did volunteer at the Children's Hospital. Um, I volunteered in a couple of different areas. Arts and medicine was one that was very near and dear to my heart, um, but then also in the uh, pharmacy. 
Um, and then I decided to go to uh, pharmacy school again at the University of Florida. I did go um, in Jacksonville. We have a distance site there. Um, and then I decided I wanted to specialize in pediatrics. So I went all the way up to Rochester, New York, which if you guys don't know, that's on the border of Canada, very cold. I had to trade in my flip flops just for some snow boots um, and, um, you know, got to meet a lot of wonderful wonderful people and trained there. Um, but then I thought that wasn't enough. So I went to the largest children's hospital in the country, which is Texas Children's Hospital uh, in Houston and did a second year uh, pediatric specialty residency. Um, before coming to UF, I actually was an assistant professor um, and a clinical pharmacy specialist in pediatric neurology in um, the medical college of, uh, or the college of um, the Georgia, uh, University of Georgia College of Pharmacy and the Medical College of Georgia. Oh, sorry, those are both a mouthful. Um, and then most recently I came uh, back to uh, UF. As you can imagine, being a bulldog in bulldog territory was not uh, uh, the most pleasing, but um, at being a gator. Um, so I came back to UF and currently I work in the pediatric ICU as a clinical pharmacy specialist, but I also teach at the University of Florida College of Pharmacy as well. Uh, next slide. Uh, so I'm not the only pediatric uh, clinical pharmacy specialist. This is a picture of some of our um, other clinical pharmacy specialists at UF uh, Health here in Gainesville, in addition to two of our um, former uh, pediatric residents. Um, so I just wanted to kind of give you guys uh, a picture. There are a few of us. We, there's um, one in almost every unit of the Children's Hospital. So um, I work in the pediatric ICU. There's one in the neonatal ICU. There's one in the cardiac, the pediatric cardiac ICU. Uh, we, you know, you might see one in the uh, pediatric hem hematology oncology floor, um, the general floor. So um, there are quite a number of us. Uh, next slide. And we're all very happy people because we work at a children's hospital. Um, so just to give you kind of a 3,000 foot view perspective of what it takes, um, it does require a, a 4D professional doctorate uh, program. Um, so you do get a doctorate of pharmacy after four years after undergrad. And that also includes your um, introductory and advanced uh, experiential rotations. Um, and then you have the option of specializing. Um, and that's where you become a licensed pharmacist and you decide to specialize in a, in a, um, a, a different area of pharmacy. Um, so pediatrics is one of many specialties. On the next slide, you'll see all of the ones um, that are available. Um, but one of the things that I think draws me and other pediatric pharmacists into um, this particular specialty in pharmacy is that it is one of the broadest specialties that we have. So you can see most of the other specialties um, are actually subspecialties within pediatrics, and we'll kind of talk about that um, on the next slide. Um, so in addition to specialties, there's also um, pharmacy board certification, so you have to take an exam to uh, prove that you are a um, competent uh, pharmacists in that uh, specific specialty. Again, pediatrics is one of many. Um, and as you can see, there's other ones like psychiatry, uh, critical care, um, infectious disease, emergency medicine. Um, and pediatrics encompasses almost all of these. Um, so when you get trained in pediatrics, you get trained um, in almost all of these, but with um, pediatric patients, so with children. Next slide. Um, so my job, I'm going to kind of give you um, a couple of different perspectives um, in terms of a day in the life. So I'm, my role is a little bit unique because I'm a clinical assistant professor. So I'm faculty at the University of Florida, um, but I also work in the pediatric ICU. So there's kind of four big um, buckets um, in terms of my job. I'm going to focus on the clinical practice uh, for the sake of this uh, particular um, meeting or this particular presentation, but just to give you an idea, I do teach quite a bit. So um, students of all kinds, College of Pharmacy, College of Medicine, um, I give lectures and I also take students on rotation. So they come with me to the PICU to experience what it's like to be a pediatric pharmacist in the PICU. I do um, a lot of research. Um, and that is clinical research um, in pediatric pharmacy. Um, and then we, I also provide a lot of services, um, whether that's to uh, organizations, which I'm at one right now, or even back to the community. Um, 
in terms of community service as well. Um, but again, for the sake of this uh, presentation, I really wanted to focus on the clinical practice. That's where um, I have the most direct uh, interaction and impact with um, pediatric patients, right? Um, and so like the previous speakers have mentioned, um, I am fortunate that I get to be a part of a multidisciplinary team that takes that has the privilege, in all honesty, to take care of these children. Honestly, sometimes um, in some of the um, most difficult times of their lives, right? So I work in an ICU or even on the hematology oncology floor. Um, you get you have the privilege of being involved with these children, their families at some of the most difficult times in their life. Um, so as a pharmacist, I'm sure if I was in the room, I would ask you guys to raise your hand, feel free to put in the chat, but how many of you as a child took a medication <laughs> that you remember? And you probably remember it didn't taste very great. We try, we try to flavor it, um, but it doesn't always work, right? Um, so in the ICU, it's a little different. Um, most of the time, oh yeah, you guys are raising your hands. Wonderful, I love technology. Um, so yes, all of you probably remember uh, the cough syrup you took, whatever, Bene you know, the, the Benadryl pill that mom gave you to help with your allergies, some Tylenol because you guys were having a fever or pain, what have you. Um, so we've all taken medications. Um, so um, it's not uh, a matter of if, it's really when. Um, and so in the ICU, it's a little different. Um, patients can take medications by mouth, um, but they, can, they usually are getting medications through um, intravenously, um, in addition to a couple of other routes of administration. Um, so a lot of my job uh, day to day does vary because I do four things, um, but day to day in clinical practice when I'm on service, I do participate in multidisciplinary rounds. So. Um, I'm sure you guys know what that entails. Uh, there's, honestly, we have a very large team in the, the pediatric ICU. Um, so there's pharmacists, dietitians, uh, physicians, um, residents, um, nurses, um, social work, uh, child life specialists, which I'm sure you guys are meeting a lot of um, representatives from those areas, which is awesome. And then my role is usually uh, the drug expert, right? So the pharmacist on the team. Um, and a lot of it really stems from having these discussions with other providers for the best interests of the patient, but also to educate those providers um, in terms of my perspective on the medication management of um, these patients. Um, that doesn't mean I don't have interaction with um, the patients themselves. So in an ICU, it really is dependent on how much, um, how awake those patients are, kind of what their clinical status is. Um, I can interact with patients, um, but usually it's their families. Um, so if they're on medications at home, I will go in and talk to them and make sure we have a good list of what medications they are on at home. Um, I will make recommendations in terms of what medications they need to be on in the hospital, as well as coordinating um, with other providers in terms of what medications they need to go home on. Um, so you know, my role is very much, very well integrated in terms of transitions of care. Um, not all pharmacists work in the ICU. So I previously worked in neurology where I was working in the ED, the ICU, the floor, and even outpatient. Um, so outpatient, you tend to have a little more patient interaction um, because patients are better, right? They're, they're, um, they're not as sick as when um, I see them in the intensive care unit. Um, but the other thing in the intensive care unit and um, other settings that a pharmacist can play a role in terms of medication is to figure out which medications they need to be on um, what doses are the most appropriate, but then also to monitor those patients, both for how well that drug is going to work, but then also to make sure that they're not having any side effects um, that we don't want to happen. Um, so, you know, one of the things that I'll talk about of why, why pediatric pharmacy is that you always have to have your thinking hat on because patients, when they're pediatric patients, are constantly changing, both physiologically and developmentally, right? And then in the ICU, they're constantly changing because of their underlying condition and what brought them into the hospital. Um, and then you have to also know uh, the medications as well. And so you're constantly um, having your thinking hat on and having to think outside the box to get children to take medications, um, even when they don't necessarily want to, which I'm sure you guys have plenty of experience in. Um, next slide. 
So why pediatric pharmacy? So I kind of already alluded to a few of these. So it is the broadest specialty. So as a pediatric pharmacist, I was trained in every subspecialty. So hematology, oncology, um, critical care, neurology, um, emergency medicine, um, inpatient, outpatient, uh, the whole gamut really, um, infectious disease. So um, that can be... Um, you know, that, that, that can give you kind of a different perspective in both ways in terms of one, you are kind of the jack of all trades when it comes to pediatric pharmacy, but it also gives you the, um, the uh, ability to subspecialize as well. Um, and sometimes that doesn't occur in residency, but it could occur, um, you know, uh, it, on the job. So I switched from being solely a pediatric neurology pharmacist to a pediatric ICU pharmacist, and it's because I'm trained in both. Um, it forces you to think outside the box, which is probably my favorite thing um, next to working for kids and with kids, um, is that it allows me to kind of push the envelope. I have to think outside the box. You have no idea how many conversations I have with um, children um, and even providers of, wait, okay, this is the best medication for this patient, but this medication comes in a pill that's like yay big. Um, a two-year-old is not going to swallow that. So what are we going to do, right? Um, and so you have to start thinking, again, outside the box. Can I crush this tablet? Can I mix it with something? Um, honestly, you even, there's something called the flavor bot. If y'all ever look into this, even for your own like children or yourselves, if you're taking medications and you have to like, you have to think about like the um, properties of medication. So if it's bitter, then you want to mix it with a sweet flavor, like maybe strawberry or um, apple to kind of negate the bitterness. Um, some other um uh, medications might have more of a sour underlying like taste. And so you, you using the flavor bot, you can actually select the medication and it'll tell you what flavors will best mask the nastiness of the medication. Um, and so we actually will use that in the retail setting, like outside the hospital, but also in the hospital. Um, so you have to think about, you know, yes, this medication is what we need for this patient to treat whatever condition they have, but can I actually give it to them, right? Um, and will they take it? So we, I've actually been involved um, in the, um, yeah, it is pretty cool. It really is. Um, I've been involved with um, counseling families and patients on um, how to sw learn to swallow medications, which I'm sure all of you, I'm sure if y'all want to raise your hands again, some of you have struggled with that. I mean, I was one of them. My brother like could not swallow pills until, well, I I shouldn't say this because this is being, being recorded, but until late. Um, and so sometimes, you know, you're mixing it with food. It's not working. You're telling them to drink it with water. It's not working. So one of the things we'll do in the hospital sometimes is I work with like child life um, and we'll have these um, sessions where we're getting them to practice how to swallow pills. And it's usually candy. So it's usually things like Skittles or um, something like that to get them to practice swallowing that before you kind of escalate to medications. Um, and sometimes that works great. Sometimes you have to, again, think outside the box and be like, okay, this is what I've got. And this is what they need. What, what, what can I do? And it's honestly trial and error, but it's a lot of fun because you get to work with the patients and their families. Um, and then ultimately, I think anybody you're going to talk to today is going to tell you we do it for the kids. Um, and honestly, one of the things that I love about kids, yes, it's fun. You get to play with them. When I was in arts and medicine, it was so much fun. I mean, I got, I would get paint all over my clothes. <laughs> um, but even, even in the ICU, you get to see them when they're running down the hall. Um, I'm like, oh, they're too, they're too well to be in the ICU. They need to go home or go to the floor. But we enjoy um, working with kids. But I think the other part of it is the resiliency. So it really is inspiring um, to work with kids because, um, you know, sometimes we, I've worked in, uh, with adult patients too, and it's not, adults are wonderful, we're all adults. Um, but they, it's just amazing to me how much resiliency these children have. And I remember, I mean, I can tell you so many stories, so many stories, but one of the ones that I remember when I was a student, I had a rotation in uh, the pediatric um, hematology oncology uh, unit. And there was a patient who had a diagnosis of, um, a particular um, cancer that uh, could not be medically managed. And that child uh, was about, I think she was eight years old. Um, so she was kind of aware of what was going on. And I just remember one day she looked at me and she goes, Renaud, you know, life's great. And I was like, and I just, I was like, what? 
And, and she just smiled at me and she was just like, you know, life's great. It's okay. Smile. And I was like, oh my gosh, I can't believe one of my patients is telling me to smile. Like it just blew my mind. Um, and it just, it's one of those things that honestly, I think motivates me to work with kids every day is just the amount of innocence and resiliency that they have. And like I said earlier in this presentation, it really is a privilege to be able to do that. Um, work with them directly, but then also, you know, the other four areas that I work in that I'm fortunate enough to work in allows me to impact um, pediatric care from different perspectives. So I do research, which means, you know, I help with optimizing medication management in these children, developing new drugs um, for these children. Um, and so even from teaching future students like y'all to take care of um, and inspire you to take care of pediatric patients um, in the future. Um, so it really is a privilege to work um, with children, um, but pediatric pharmacy is fun. Um, you do need to know a little bit of math though. Uh, I, I still have my old fashioned like calculator. I don't have it with me right now, um, but you can ask all the, the folks in the PICU. They always make fun of me because I have my little calculator. Um, next slide. But um, it, like I said, it was an absolute pleasure uh, talking to you guys. I've included my contact information here. Feel free to reach out to me. Um, you know, if, if you guys, if we have time for questions, I'd be happy to answer any questions right now. But um, otherwise, thank you very much for the opportunity to come speak to y'all. Thank you so much, Dr. Abu Sawa, for your presentation. Um, it's really exciting to learn about like the day-to-day -day life of being a pediatric pharmacy specialist. And I think it's something that maybe not all people consider right away because they don't know about it. But then when you learn about it, it's incredibly exciting. Um, and just like the amazing impact you have on the kids' lives. And so our next speaker is Ms. Jennifer Duncanson, who will be talking about her work as a child life specialist. Hello, thank you so much, Julia. So as she said, my name is Jennifer Duncanson and I am a certified child life specialist. So I'm sure that a lot of you here are familiar with the work of child life through footprints, but I'm going to assume for this presentation, there are at least some of you that are not. Um, so you can go to the next slide, please. Um, and the next slide. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit today about where exactly we fit into the pediatric puzzle. So I think almost every speaker so far has mentioned child life, which I'm sitting over here like, yes, this is awesome. Um, but we are a part of the puzzle. And so we're going to just talk about where exactly we fit in. Uh, next slide. So just a little bit about me. Um, I was born and raised in Gainesville, Florida and attended UF like everyone else from my undergrad. Um, and I actually was a footprints volunteer. So that's where I learned about child life. I think I was in the second year of the program, so way back before they did any of this extra stuff. So it's really cool to kind of see how it's evolved uh, today. Um, so in 2017, I earned the credentials of a certified child life specialist, and my first job was in the pediatric radiation oncology setting. So I worked with kids who had cancer who needed that daily radiation. Um, and then in March of this year, I shifted gears and I'm actually now working in a nonprofit setting. So instead of working directly in the clinical setting, I'm working more so with the siblings and the caregivers and kind of looking at the family as a whole, um, which as you probably know, when a child is diagnosed with cancer, essentially the whole family is diagnosed. So it's important that each person in that family unit is getting that care. So that's something I'm able to help provide in my setting today. Um, for the purpose of this presentation, I'm focusing on the clinical role of child life because that's where the majority of child life specialists practice. Um, so just keep that in mind that this is, we're present in schools, we're present in dental clinics, nonprofits, but major, majority in the hospital setting. Um, next slide, please. So what exactly is a child life specialist? So child life specialists are professionals trained in helping children and families cope with the stress and uncertainty of some of life's most challenging events. So this can be anything from an illness uh, to a trauma or even a death. Um, we are able to provide support during that time in hopes of just making the whole healthcare experience as positive as possible. But at the end of the day, that's our goal. Um, so how do we do this? We utilize four main pillars, if you will. So those are play, preparation, education, and normalization activities. And the goal of all four of those is just to simply decrease the child's anxiety and fear and to increase their coping skills. Child life specialists are often also looked at as the patient advocate. I think anyone in the multidisciplinary team could be said to be the, multi to be the patient advocate. Um, so 
it's definitely not solely a child eye specialist job, but we are able to kind of look at things through the child's eyes because we are trained in development. Um, so oftentimes we will be looked at as that patient voice in a situation where maybe the child is unable to speak up for themselves or just not comfortable doing so. Um, and like everyone else, we are part of the multidisciplinary team. You're okay, next slide. Um, and as you can see on this graphic, we fit into the puzzle right alongside everybody else. So this is just a small snippet of the puzzle. There are so many people that play a role um, in the care, just like Dr. Slayton mentioned, but we are right there alongside everybody. So that's what's really cool. Um, and it's truly a privilege to be a part of that multidisciplinary team. Next slide. So the first pillar uh, I'm gonna talk about is play. So this is the one, if you're a Footprints volunteer, you're probably all shaking your head. Yes, we know we play with, with kids. That's one of the reasons that I went into this job because it's a fun job. Um, but what I think a lot of people don't always realize when they see child life, you know, walking in the hallway with a wagon full of toys or um, in the playroom, not working, is that we actually are working. We're playing with a purpose. And that purpose is to teach children. So sometimes, uh, play is said to be, you know, child's work or play is the language of children. And that's because that's where they are able to express themselves. And that's where they are able to actually learn and grow. So play is super important. If a child is, for example, ex uh, hospitalized for an extended period of time, because, you know, they would be learning through play at home or in school. So it's important that those play opportunities are provided, even though they're in the medical setting. So play is also utilized as a therapeutic modality in the world of child life. And this is often looked at as um, medical play, which I'll talk about a little bit later. So some of the benefits of play, like we already talked about, it promotes continuing development. So this is how children learn and grow and it's really crucial to that, to that development. So it's important that those opportunities are provided. Um, play normalizes the medical environment. So when a child walks past the playroom, they know exactly what happens in that room. They know that it's a room where they can just be a kid, they can have fun. Um, there's no, it's, it's considered a safe space, if you will. Um, play facilitates emotional expression and enhances the child's understanding and coping, especially if um, child life is using it as a therapeutic modality to try and teach a child something or prepare them for a procedure through play. It can really help to enhance that understanding. Um, and it's also a time for child life to clear up any misconceptions they have. So if they're playing through a procedure and, you know, they're trying to place an IV in a teddy bear's cheek or something, you know, you can kind of correct that understanding in a playful way, um, but truly kind of see where they're at developmentally and where they're at with their understanding of what it is that they're going through. Next slide. So the next pillar of child life is education. Um, I think this quote kind of sums it up perfectly and it just says, in a world where children are excluded from adult answers to basic questions, those they work out for themselves will almost inevitably be more distressing and unhelpful. So I think this is so important because a lot of times parents and sometimes even providers um, don't feel it's appropriate to share all the information with the child. And of course there are situations where it's not appropriate to share the full extent of the information, but providing education in an age and developmentally appropriate manner about an illness or a diagnosis or a procedure is so important. Because if you don't, the children are going to fill in those gaps, whether you like it or not. Their magical thinking is going to run wild, and um, they're going to come up with something that most of the time is worse than the actual reality. So providing that education is something that's often looked to the child life specialist to do. Um, a lot of parents aren't always comfortable telling their child that they have cancer or explaining that they have to go through surgery tomorrow or whatever it is that they're going through. Um, so we are trained to, to kind of take that burden off the parents and, and provide that education. Um, so not only can we provide education on the diagnosis or procedures, but we can also provide education um, and teach children about different coping strategies. You know, how are they gonna get through this diagnosis and how can they do it? Um, in a healthy manner, if you will. So maybe it's uh, guided imagery during procedures or um, maybe it's drawing and, play. you know, there's a whole host I could go on for days about coping strategies, but that's another thing that we can provide education on. Um, and in addition, just the medical personnel in the environment. What are all these machines in my room and who are all these people that are, you know, poking and prodding me every day? You know, why are they here? So just kind of 
being the teacher about the hospital is how I explain it to kids. So there's a whole lot of tools that are available to us. Um, I love to utilize books when I'm using doing education sessions. And so the H's for Hair Fairy is an example of a book that kind of starts the conversation about hair loss. So, you know, we all know that cancer treatment often comes with hair loss, and that can be a very tough conversation to have. So bibliotherapy is a great way to kind of start the conversation in a very child-friendly way. Um, next slide. So preparation, in my opinion, falls under the same umbrella as education, but I look at it more so as like procedural pre preparation. That's usually what you're preparing the child for. So the goal of preparation is to make an unknown situation familiar and predictable. Unfortunately, there's not always time to have, you know, a 30 minute preparation session. Some procedures are emergent and are happening right away and you're trying to prepare the child as it's happening to them in the heat of the moment. Um, ideally, you know in advance, the nurse or doctor tells you about it, it's not emergent, it's planned, and you're able to have a 30 minute preparation session where you're really able to prepare the child. Um, so during this session, it's really important to include uh, sensory information. So is it gonna feel hot or cold? Are they going to smell anything? Are they going to hear anything? Is it gonna taste funny? You know, all of those things are concrete things that children can hold on to. And then in turn, it makes them feel like they have control over the situation because they know what's going to happen. Um, so also including a sequence of events, just telling them step-by-step step what's going to happen to them will help to alleviate any of those fears of the unknown that they might have. So the goal at the end is that they feel in control, they walk into their procedure, and they're able to cooperate, which is great for the medical team, um, because they know what's going to happen. They're not as scared as they were prior. Um, so just for these pictures, in case you're like, what in the world is happening in these photos? So the Mr. Potato Head and Spider-Man there, both um, were a result of a preparation session I had at my last job with a child who needed to make a face mask for the radiation. So that is typically a very scary procedure for kids. It doesn't hurt, but the process of placing a piece of plastic and shaping it to their face is just very frightening. So, and it's also something they've never heard of before. And I would almost bet none of you have ever seen a radiation mask. So you can imagine that hearing you have to have this thing done and having no idea what it looks like can be very scary. So these were two masks that I made um, with kids to kind of show them exactly what it's gonna feel like. You know, they got to take on the role of um, the radiation therapist and actually help me make it. And in turn, when it was their time, to make their mask, they were able to do it successfully. And you know, it wasn't, it wasn't so scary after all. Next slide, please. And the fourth pillar that I think is one of the most self-explanatory is normalization. So we briefly touched on this earlier, but essentially this is just um, a child life specialist will do their best to normalize the medical environment and to normalize the illness or disability that a child might be having. So there's a whole lot of tools and resources out there in the world um, that can kind of assist in the normalization process. You can see the, the bottom picture, um, this hospital utilized decals and uh, underwater fish, I think is on the wall, to normalize that, that scanning room. So, I mean, what kid doesn't wanna hop on a submarine and get their a photo of their brain taken, you know? So it just helps normalize what could have been a very white and sterile environment. Um, the book Uniquely Me, it normalizes limb differences. You can see that he only has one hand. Um, so how cool would it be if you looked like that and you get a book and, you know, they look just like you? Um, and then Bald Barbie, I love Bald Barbie. I used her a lot as well in my last job. And there was one little girl who was very, very worried about what other people were gonna think of her when she was losing her hair because of her chemo and radiation. And so I gave her this bald Barbie and you know, she looked back at me, she's like, she's so beautiful. And so it was a great way to start the conversation of, yes, she is beautiful, even though she's bald, you know, your friends are still gonna think you're beautiful. And you know, like it just normalized that whole thing and that whole experience for her. Um, and turn something that she was very, very nervous about into something that she was kind of proud to show off. She would walk around showing everyone her bald Barbie. So it was um, the, all these tools as a whole, in addition to medical play and um, just having a routine in the hospital can help to normalize the hospital experience for kids. So 
That was a lot of information very quickly, but I just want you to take away that child life specialists uh, we're part of the multidisciplinary team, and our main goal is just to help reduce the anxiety and fear that children experience while they're going through a healthcare um, experience. So if you have any questions, I think my contact information is on the next page. Feel free to reach out. Um, and thank you so much for having me. Thank you so much for sharing all of that, Ms. Duncanson. It was really nice, first of all. Like, I think it's so cool that you were in Footprints. Um, and I also just love the concept of playing with a purpose. I think for those of us that are volunteering on the unit, like that's such a cool way to think about it and really think about like the impact that you can have just by playing with kids. Um, so that was excellent. Thank you so much. So next up, we have Miss Emily Marquis, who will be describing her work as the Streetlight Program Director at Chans. And the topic of her presentation will be Streetlight, a psychosocial palliative care program for teenagers and young adults. Thank you so much. I, I've been looking through your videos to see if I recognize any of you from the unit. And I just want to start by thanking you all for what you do in, in Footprints. Um, a lot of what I'm going to talk about with the background of Streetlight, you're going to understand because we see a lot of the same patients. So Streetlight is a palliative care program, and that means that we are focusing on patients that have a chronic illness, and we're following them from diagnosis through cure or end of life. So we see patients that are oncology patients, but we also focus on other populations like cystic fibrosis, uh, organ transplants, sickle cell disease, autoimmune, and just about anybody that is a teen or young adult that will come into the hospital. Um, but we're focusing our support on those that are going to have a really uh, challenge life experience because of their illness. And so that's where we see a lot of the patients that you see in footprints. And you know, a lot of people say, you know, we, we do it for the kids. I'm, I'm really doing it for the teens and young adults because I think, and you understand this because you're in this population, you are old enough to understand what's happening in a way that smaller kids do not understand. I am so interested in working with people that are diagnosed with cancer that know exactly what they're going to miss out on in life. They are mourning the relationships that they'll never have, the careers that they may not get to have in the way that they thought. And then working within that mentality to see how can we find meaning in a life that this person didn't ask for? And what can we do to help them feel like they've left their mark on the world? We operate within a framework of social support as our main vehicle for doing that. And so if some of you are on a public health track or a health education and behavior track, I did, um, just for reference, in undergrad, I did English and criminology because I thought that I was gonna go into law school because I loved communicating. And then I started volunteering in Streetlight back in 2009. And I thought, gosh, like these relationships you get to make are so authentic with these patients when your only goal is to just make relationship. And for teens, social support is so important. So I did go back and get a master's from UF in health education and behavior. But I'd say really the biggest teacher for me is just the experience of meeting people and partnering with them through their illness trajectory and end of life. So when you're a teen and, and young adult, a lot of you have, have probably heard of Erickson stages of development if you're in developmental psych. So you understand that a lot of your identity is formed around the people in your peer group and who you model yourself after. And so for our patients who are 13 to 30, which is the population that I focus on, if they're in the hospital, they don't have that. And if they had an illness for a long period of time, they maybe didn't get to go to a mainstream school and get that normal peer experience. So that's where we're coming in. There's something called the stress buffering model of social support. And it's the idea that if you can give someone social support, it will mitigate or reduce the pathogenic or disease causing effects of stress. And there was an interesting study in 
2013 that looked at people with social isolation, people who reported social isolation, loneliness, which means your perception of your social in your life doesn't meet the reality, which is lower, and people who lived alone. And they found out that people who reported those three categories actually were 30% more likely to die earlier. So that's why I think it's so important to provide social support. And for those of you who have had to navigate being a college student at UF, you know how difficult it is, even in a huge university, to make friends. And so that, that's where we train our volunteers. And I, I know you receive that same training, so you understand what we do in Streetlight is we're trying to pick people who have had an experience in their life that is an illness experience or partner with someone through end of life. And then we're asking them to commit a minimum two years because a lot of times people will have a long period of time with treatment or they'll relapse. And so it's helpful to have the same folks. And I'm sure those of you who have been around for a while in Footprints, you see patients come back and it's so good when you have an existing relationship. Um, we are doing a lot of legacy building and trying to celebrate milestones so that the time spent going through treatment isn't wasted time. So that looks like a lot of different things. And it, you know, some of the issues that I'm focusing on in my work are like, we might have a young woman who has a child who was diagnosed with cancer, finished treatment, and now she's relapsed and she is pregnant with her next child, what do we do? Like, do you have to make a decision between treatment or having the child? How do you navigate those conversations with your partner? Um, that that's, that's like one example. I'd, you know, another would be somebody who uh, is finished with treatment and he is trying to get a job, but his insurance, which is Medicaid, which is a government reinforced uh, insurance, is not going to cover him to work 40 hours. He'll lose his, his benefits. He could maybe only work 10 hours and keep his insurance. But he needs that insurance because if he relapses again, there's no way to pay for it with private insurance. So how do we help him navigate finding his calling in life if he feels clipped by his illness. Um, a lot of it is bedside support and getting to know someone and building that trust, learning what's important to them that's outside of their illness. And then it's coming up with ways to really support them in that. And so like when somebody's ending treatment, maybe we will make a scrapbook of uh, different affirmations that we feel like are important for that person. So they have that appraisal support when they leave treatment and know that they have what it takes to keep going. Maybe um, we're connecting with that person outside of the hospital. So we have this whole virtual community in Streetlight called Streetlight Go Team, Streetlight Gaming and Online Team. We have um, a Discord. Some of you that are into gaming, you may use Discord. We have a private server and we offer a lot of different things through that. We'll stream movies. We have this uh, collaborative Minecraft realm. We do a survival challenge right now where we're having patients complete different challenges. And then we get 3D printed prizes that are inspired by Minecraft um, because we know somebody at the HSC library who has been super helpful for us with, with printing. Um, we're doing like a NBA fantasy uh, draft right now. Um, and just ways to make people feel connected so that when... When something really tough happens, they have a community that they know that they can go to and get that support. And I find, I think what's really interesting to me in, in doing this for 12 years now is uh, partnering with the survivors, because it's not like when you just stop treatment, everything gets magically better. A lot of people have trauma when they go back to their appointments. Um, talking about people going to scans, like the thought my entire world could turn upside down right now at the end of this day with whatever's, uh, you know, with these scans. And those scans are no joke. I mean, you're, you're getting uh, infused with contrast. You have to sit there for 90 minutes while, while it goes through your body through an IV. And then you got to go in your scans. So it's a very anxious process, you know, with all of the follow-up that goes with treatment. Uh, and a lot of the health issues that come out of treatment too, because these chemotherapies cause uh, other health concerns as well. And I think that helping us recognize that for all of our lives, you know, there's going to be things that happen that are outside of
of our control. There's going to be bad situations that we can't undo. But how, how do you find meaning in suffering? That's really the arena that we're working with in, in this program in particular. And so um, training, I told you I have a, a master's in health education behavior from UF. My assistant director is trained as a chaplain. Um, we've had several people in the program that have had masters in divinity as, as staff. We have two full-time staff members, um, three part-time staff members, and then our volunteer team is about 60 people. So I think it takes a psychosocial spiritual support, uh, approach to supporting this teenage and young adult group where they're at in their development. And I just thank all of you for opening yourselves up to positioning yourself close to people who are in pain and suffering, because it is difficult to know how to orient yourself when you can't take someone's pain away. And even if you become a physician, you know, there, there's still people that are not getting through cancer treatment. I think 89,000 adolescents, young adults, uh, I got diagnosed with cancer last year, 9,000 of them died. So this is something that we're actively working on doing better. But what we can control is giving compassionate humanitarian care. And you can do that in any job that you have. So I, I just wish you all the best. If any of you are in your senior year and you're like, holy cow, what is my job going to be? I did not know that I was going to be called to do streetlight until my senior year. And I remember having a lot of breakdowns as I contemplated, oh my gosh, I'm going to graduate. I'm going to miss my calling. What, what is that going to be like? And then our director at the time found funding to create a new position for me. And then it happened like that. So just, just telling you, you may not even know what your, your job that's going to open up. That's really going to light our heart. You might not even know it exists right now, but I just tell you to trust and keep following what you know that you love to do. Um, at least for me, that, that breathed into something that I, I just couldn't imagine leaving. So. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ms. Markey, for highlighting, you know, the importance of providing the social support and having meaningful conversations and just the impact of street life. Um, it's really inspiring. Um, and you said, you said one thing, um, how can we find meaning in a life they didn't ask for? Yeah. I think that kind of applies to all of us going through, you know, rough situations and very meaningful. Thank you so much. Appreciate it, Julie. Thank you. Take care. And so uh, next we have Ms. Susan Lee and Ms. Catherine Johnson from Camp Boggy Creek. Um, and I actually attended Camp Boggy Creek a few weeks ago and it was such an incredible experience. I'm incredibly excited uh, to hear on behalf of you guys tonight. We are so excited to be here. Thank you Footprints for hosting Camp Boggy Creek. Um, we just wanna say a huge shout out to the countless hours of volunteer hours that so many um, Footprint volunteers have come to camp, helped, get kids on a bus in Chance, Jacksonville, help the Child Life team work and get the word out about camp. And we just wanna thank you. And um, we truly feel that Camp Boggy Creek is an extension of the healthcare team there in Jacksonville and Chance and Gainesville and Tallahassee. And we just really feel it's an important part of the healing process for kids. And gosh darn it, we like kids to have fun. So we hope you come and join us one of these days. So next slide. And Katherine Johnson here, she's going to talk about our volunteer. Um, my name is Susan Lee. I'll do my little introduction. I'm a child life specialist, so I was so excited to hear all the child life specialists on the call and all the talk about child life specialists. It's a role dear and near and dear to my heart, and I just really um, love all that what child life specialists do. And Katherine is our volunteer coordinator, and she knows everything volunteer, and she's going to give us a little snippet of how um, volunteers can get involved at Camp Buggy Creek. But Camp Buggy Creek, we are in charge of creating fun since 1996. We are celebrating our 25th anniversary this year, and we could not be more excited to have our gates still open, even with COVID, um, and keep welcoming families and just having fun and a safe place for our kids and families to feel safe, respected, and loved. So at camp, our, our kind of mantra is, yes, you can. You can have fun. You can do things that maybe you didn't think were possible, but we make it happen. We'll go to the next slide. So our mission is to foster a spirit of joy by creating a free, that's right, completely free to families, children um, across the state of Florida, safe and um, medically sound camp environment that enriches the lives of children and families with serious illness. Um, so basically there is never a fee for anybody to ever come to our camp. Um, it is free to our families and we really, that is just part of our mission and we, create a lot of joy at camp. Since 1996, opening our gates, 
We serve over 85,000 families. And we welcome about, in a typical average year, about 3,500 children and families. Of course, we've modified a little bit to be our safe, respected in COVID, and we've had some you know, distancing, a little masking, a little bit of a modification to our program, but camp is still very much there. Um, camp started as a dream of a camper that had to go all the way up to Connecticut, and she's like, well, why is there not one of these camps here in Florida? So that conversation led to another conversation, led to another conversation, which led to Paul Newman coming into somebody's living room, which would be so exciting. Um, and just magic happened. So everybody was talking about how it takes a united team. That was Camp Boggy Creek. It was a team. It was a team across the entire state of Florida. From Shan's um, UF Health was a part of our very founding hospital systems. We had doctors, nurses that wanted our camp to happen. And that was just kind of started as a dream and it happened and came to reality. So it's kind of a cool little back history there. Go on the next page. So we have 232 acres of fun. That's right, 232 acres of fun in the middle of, well, it's kind of nowhere land, but it's outside of Orlando in Eustis, Florida. We got boating and fishing and arts and crafts. We got theater and horseback riding, miniature golf, archery. Yep, a 32 foot tall tower, um, outdoor fun, nature, swimming, wood shop, and even more. All the buildings you see there are um, all accessible. We are all air conditioned. We can address any um, different abilities or disabilities that children may have or their needs of accessibility in all the rooms. We're not sleeping in tents out at Camp Boggy Creek. It's a state of the art facility. Go ahead, next slide. So why is it so important to have a place where kids can come and be themselves, kind of have fun and kind of do normal kid stuff. Well, kids with chronic illness they have a lot of it. Um, research has proven that there is anxiety, depression, feelings of isolation, PTSD. They have adjustment difficulties. They are in the hospital one month. They're out of the hospital. They have to go back to school. They have to go to virtual school. There's a lot of um, fluctuations. There's a lot of fluctuations just being a normal kid and that add a serious illness onto that it adds a lot of complex issues. Mood disorders, school regression. So what camp does, it really adds a place where kids can have respite, but they don't feel so different. They can create friendships. A lot of our kids, you know, really don't get a chance to practice making friends. So they get the opportunity to kind of have friends for like good friends that are gonna last a lifetime. They have peer connections, they get to practice so social skills. We have a theory at Camp Boggy Creek. We challenge by choice. So if you really want to do something, we'll challenge you. You can do it. But if you don't want to, you don't have to do it. Um, we build confidence. Yes, you can. We encourage kids to try something new. That's another big thing we do. Everything at camp is real intentional and in what we do and how we say things because we want these kids to take what they learn at Camp Boggy Creek about being safe, respected, and loved and take that out to their world and be able to feel more independent and have better control of their health because they know that they're safe at Camp Buggy Creek and they understand their illnesses and they know they're not the only one that's facing the different challenges that they have. A lot of times kids have improved self-esteem and an interest in their school activities. One of the biggest things we take out of our um, kids is that they understand their illness better because they're able to talk to other kids and medical um, personnel that come out, volunteers that come out, and even meet people that are much farther along in their process. Um, they're able to kind of experience, well, if they can do it, I can do it. So it's definitely a really safe place for kids to come. Next slide. So what illnesses do we serve? We do serve um, oncology and Dr. Bill Slayton is one of our amazing uh, doctor volunteers that comes out. Him and his wife, Marcy and the entire family come and spend the whole week at Camp Boggy Creek during our North Cancer Week, um, along with many other volunteers from Shands and several foot, footprint volunteers have come as well. We do serve about 16 different illness groups in specific programming. So we try to keep our illness groups kind of together. So there is that common bond. There is a commonality of illness, but it's really not a huge focal point of what we're doing at camp. The illness brings us together, but Camp Buggy Creek is the family that we create. Um, we have diabetes, epilepsy, gastro disorders, heart immune transplant, renal disorders. We serve ages seven to 16. And um, we also offer a range of different um, programs. Next slide. 
So our year round program, um, we are fully staffed and we are open year round. And so we have um, year round retreat program, and then we have our summer camp program, and then we have a couple of leader in training and camper transition programs. So our family retreat begins our opportunities for volunteers to come as well at any of these different um, programs, but volunteer um, family retreats are when family comes and they bring their whole family and they get to interact in all the different camp activities as a family. Traditionally with different activities, kids would go with other kids and different things, but we've modified that. So we have the family going around to different activities and getting to see the sights and sounds of camp. They do archery, they do boating and fishing. We even have a stage day. And one of our favorite parts is always having the dads get up and be silly or do something, or like the kids see their mom, like, you know, kind of interacting and letting go a little bit. It's, it's awesome. Um, and then they get to kind of share their stories, share their experiences. And so family retreats are really special. It is one of our building blocks for our program. Um, we try to bring families to our family retreat weekends so that they understand that Camp Boggy Creek is a very special and different place. And it is very safe for their children because kids with serious illness have a lot of things and families it's hard to let them go to summer camp. And I, at age seven, it's you know even harder, but the, knowing what we have, the medical staff that we have and the facilities that we have, they're able to come and experience it. So it helps them be more able to come and ready to come for summer. And summer is our June through August. And it is eight wonderful weeks full of about 150 kids coming to camp and they get to do all the fun things in age, like age appropriate groups and they get to just have fun. They do cheers. Camp has never been more fun during summer. It is awesome. Uh, we look forward to having our regular summer program back very soon. Um, but that is usually from June to August. And then our two programs that I really want to talk about is our leading our training camper and training and camper transition programs. So the leader in training camper transition or camper and training program, those are really hard to say. So we usually just call it LIT. So the leader in training programs are for campers to kind of engage in opportunities to learn about leadership. They get opportunities to lead a group. Maybe they're helping out in the cabins. They're kind of um, a camper that's grown up, but yet not yet ready to be a counselor, but they're added extra responsibilities. So at Camp Boggy Creek, we want to set kids up for success. We want them to have the tools in their toolbox to be able to go and be, I can get that job because I know that in myself, I have the, I'm proud of myself and I can do it. And I can do it because I did it at Camp Boggy Creek, I can do it here. So we encourage family or the campers to try new things and do new things. And the LLT program is one of those programs that kind of provides a safety net for them to kind of build those skills, but yet have a very safe environment where they can ask questions. And, you know, if they fail, we help them boost them back up and we get them tried again. The camper transition program is for our older campers that have aged out of the program. And they actually get to come back and they do intensive leadership training. So these kids come back and they are in a program where they do all kinds of really fun stuff. They learn how to change a tire. Maybe they learn about their finances. One of the most important things they talk about is when you're a kid with a chronic or serious illness, and you've had all this medicine, so you've had chemo and you've had radiation and you had all these illnesses, you need to be able to tell that story to your next physician. So that's one of our steps that we really try to help our campers understand that it's really important to know your steps in your healthcare process. So we encourage them to get that information so that they're able to transition over into the adult world because adults are a little scary. That's a scary place for us. <laughs> So that's another thing. They learn all kinds of different tools, a lot of resources, and they just get to have a lot of fun too. Next slide. So we do offer specialized medicine, and the facility we offer that in is our patch, and it is a full medically, medical facility located right on property. We have a doctor, a physician, and a nurse all around on staff year round. We also bring in summer nurses, volunteer physicians, nurses, pharmacists, child specialists, medical staff from the specific groups to come and help us take care of the kids. The best part of that is you guys work with the kids in the hospital. So when they see you at Camp Boggy Creek, they're like, I know you. And then they automatically, there's this great magic that happens where the kids and the staff get to see, get to see each other having fun outside of the hospital area. So 
if you ever get a chance to volunteer, I was a volunteer many years ago, but to see the kids outside of the hospital environment, is just game changer. And so that's our patch. These are our little volunteers. We love our volunteers. Thank you, Footprints, all your volunteers. And so I think the next slide, I think I've talked really fast, is getting involved. I'm gonna turn it over to Katherine Johnson and see if she has anything to say about volunteers. I have a few things to say. Thank you, Susan. Um, and kind of like Susan said, I was scrolling through the list and looking at uh, some people who had their cameras on. I see a lot of familiar names. So um, hello, everyone. I'm, I even saw some names from people who didn't get to volunteer at camp last spring because of COVID. Um, and when we shut down, so I still remember you and I'm sorry it didn't work out that time, but I'm so glad that you're still involved with footprints and, um, you know, hopefully, you know, some kind of wind will, uh, you know, blow you through Camp Buggy Creek one day. Um, and like Susan said, um, Dr. Bill is actually one of um, our, uh, our medical volunteers. He'll be at camp next weekend, actually, for our cancer family um, getaway. So, uh, so I want to talk to you. Susan has given a really great and thorough overview of what Camp Boggy Creek is, who we serve, um, and an overall general overview of, you know, volunteer opportunities. But I want to talk to you specifically um, about what volunteer opportunities are available now and coming up in the spring. Um, and that's all I'm going to talk about, spring 2022. We're not talking about summer 2022 because we're not there yet. Um, at Camp Boggy Creek, um, we're not in any rush. Um, we serve children who have chronic and serious illnesses, um, and there's no rush in that in a pandemic. We're going to take our time um, and uh, make sure that safety is always our number one priority. So uh, we might not return to our residential um, summer camp program, um, you know, super soon, um, but we're going to make sure we're doing what's right for our campers and their families. So for spring 2022, what we're going to do, uh, what we, the program, the on-site program we started this year is our family getaway weekends. Um, so this does come with some COVID protocols, uh, which I will cover over today, but spring 2022, um, the exact schedule is not finalized. It's almost there, uh, but we will have family getaway weekends from mid-January to the beginning of April. We have a family getaway weekend um, every other weekend, um, and we accept up to 14 families and 13 volunteers. Uh, when you come to volunteer at camp, you can consider camp your home away from home for the weekend. Uh, we will cover all your food and all your housing, um, and the time commitment is Friday at 3.30 p.m to Sunday at about noon. Uh, when you first arrive to camp, we're going to have a really great orientation before the families arrive. So that way you get a really good, you, so that way we'll teach you what you're going to be doing because um, we're not just going to throw you in there. So we want to make sure you know uh, what you'll be doing. But what you will be doing is you'll be hosting one of our awesome activity areas. And then you're also going to be paired with one specific family and you'll check in on them um, at certain points during the weekend, kind of be their camp liaison for us. Uh, now some requirements to volunteer. You do have to be at least 19 years old to volunteer at Camp Buggy Creek. Our medical and immunization requirements are, uh, we do require two doses of the MMR vaccine, measles, mumps, and rubella, uh, the varicella vaccine, or history of chickenpox illness, the COVID-19 vaccine, the flu vaccine, the current seasonal flu vaccine. Um, we only require that for our, our spring weekends, just, just FYI. So that will start in the spring. Um, you should get your flu shot anyway. Um, and then a current TB test. So TB test, negative TB test results from within 12 months uh, when you'll be arriving on camp. Uh, now some COVID precautions, precautions that we're going to have in place to keep everybody safe, including you, uh, is we keep a strict six feet, at least six feet of social distance um, from everybody at all times. Uh, we, it is mandatory that everyone wear face masks indoors, uh, and we do provide private housing for all of you volunteers. Um, if you want more information about volunteering, please check out the volunteer page on the Camp Buggy Creek website. Um, take a screenshot of my contact information right there. Um, if you want me to email you directly when the spring 2022 calendar is finalized, email me right now. It doesn't have to be a super long email. You can just say, hi, my name is Madison. I'm going to pick on you because I can see you. You say, hi, name. my name is Madison Burns. Can you send me the spring 2022 calendar? That's all you got to do. So whatever you 
your name is, send me an email right now. I will send you that calendar when it's available. Uh, online, the online application volunteer registration will begin, uh, will open on November 15th. Um, because we can only accept up to 13 volunteers per weekend right now, the spots do fill up really quickly. Um, so you're going to want to register on November 15th. Um, otherwise, there's not going to be any more spots available. Uh, we do utilize wait lists. So um, if, if all the spots fill up, you can sign yourself to be placed on the wait list. Um, and we do use our wait list quite regularly. Um, so that's it. I know that was very quick, but I know this is recorded and going to be put on your YouTube channel. So just go ahead and fast forward if you want to hear all of that again, or check out um, the volunteer page on our Camp Boggy Creek website. And uh, just one thing I wanted to close with is whenever you get to what, you know, wherever you end up in your life next in the health professions, in the medical field, please volunteer please remember to volunteer. Uh, can't, we cannot operate our programming without our medical staff. It's in our charter. Um, it, we can't do it. So uh, medical volunteers are what keep our programs and programs like ours going. So please don't forget uh, to keep that love of volunteering alive um, once you kind of move on to what's next in your life. So thank you all so much. And hopefully we'll, well, I know I'll see some of you at camp real soon, um, but the rest of you hopefully um, in the near future as well. Thank you so much, both of you. I know every time anyone goes to Camp Boggy Creek and they volunteer and they come back, they're just like, they spend the whole week talking about how much fun they had. And everyone always has a great experience. So we love to have you guys here and to hear more about it. Um, so thank you so much. Um, our next speaker we have is Dr. Claudia Senesak, who will be talking about her work as a pediatric physical therapist. I think you're muted. Thank you. Um, <laughs> yeah. I'm going to give you just an overview of pediatric physical therapy in the community. And I do want to put in a, a boggy creek. Love the camp. And I've taken lots of physical therapy students down there um, some of those weekends. So I encourage you all to try and get down there. It's really a, a fun place. Uh, you can go to the next slide. This is just my contact information. Um, I am a clinical professor at the University of Florida, but I also have a private practice in town called Kids on the Move. And that's my contact at Kids on the Move. Next slide. So as I said, I just wanted to give you an overview of community pediatric physical therapy. What do you, a child that might be discharged from the hospital um, that has maybe had an injury or been early, um, maybe they've had childhood cancer and may need some help with rehabilitation a skill or learning a new skill. Next slide. So one of the big things that um, is really important is being able to collaborate as a team member. And to do that, you be good at communication. The strength of a team is each individual member and each member is the team. And so communication is really the key to making this work. That refer to patient, if I just treat them in isolation, um, they might get better, but I'm missing the whole patient. It's really, really important for me to communicate with the entire team. Next slide. So who makes up this team? Who are the members of the team? 
Well, obviously the patient is important, but also really important is the family. Is going to be critical because we're talking about children. And what's different about working with children, especially young children, it's not like any other patient. I can't say to the child, I want you to go home and I want you to do your exercises. I want you to do five reps, uh, quad sets. It doesn't work like that with children. I need to get buy-in from the family. I need to work directly with that family, caregivers, maybe with friends of the family. I need to really earn their trust in order for, to understand how important it is to follow through with some of the things that I'm saying for their child to get better. Other members of the team are going to be the nurses that saw them in the hospital or might play a role with them in follow-up clinic. Maybe this child has specialty clinics that they need to go to at the hospital. This was a referral that I got from a private practice um, pediatrician in town. We, frankly, we get referrals from all over the state. We get referrals from out of state. I have patients that have come from out of the country um, for a consult. So we're getting referrals from places. So it's gonna be really important that I'm gonna communicate with all of the individuals, healthcare workers, and sometimes educators that are involved with this. So we get lots of follow through. Um, it might be speech pathologists, might be dietitians, it might be other staff members, social workers. Um, it's going to be really important the community where this patient lives. It's important to make sure that our goals are not just about one body part, but about child overall and everything in that child's environment. All right, next slide. So what is the role of the physical therapist? What are we gonna do when a patient comes to us? We're gonna do an evaluation, and do some type of maybe standardized assessment. It's almost mandatory now for us to do some type of either standardized or criterion referenced assessment for insurance purposes. Um, we're going to coordinate with team members, and we just went over who might be part of that team. And part of that is for their care, but also another part is to play a role in differential diagnosis. A lot of times we'll get referrals and a child won't have a diagnosis yet. And physical therapists typically don't make the diagnosis, but we play a role in differential diagnosis based on what our expertise are. And we'll, we'll talk about what that is in a minute. Some of the observations that I make on the job might be critical in helping the doctor uh, the primary care physician actually make a referral to the next specialist to actually identify what the diagnosis is. And that's a really critical role to play. I also want to provide this family with resources that will connect this family and this patient with the community. And that might be a support group. It might be connecting them with steps. The Early Steps program in the community is a federally funded program for children zero to three years. It's not income-based, but it provides um, physical therapy, occupation, speech therapy, as well as um, what's called ITDS workers. They're like educating the home 
and provide early intervention. Um, every child in the state of Florida is in evaluation by an early steps program and an early steps team to see if they qualify for these services. This is not financially based. So if your child is delayed or has a particular they will qualify for this program. And then they don't have to bill their insurance company. You can bill their and early steps would be the last payer of reserve of resort, or you can opt out and say, I don't want you to bill my insurance company. I want early steps to pay for these, these services in the first three years of life. The other role of a therapist is to family and or empower the child. Um, I want to empower this family to help their gain skills. And that involves coaching a family. A lot of families don't know how to help their child. So that's possible. If it's an older child, I wanna empower that child to get better, to take an active role. I wanna enhance a child's development or their recovery and to also empower a family to understand their child and their child's condition. It's really difficult for a lot of families to understand the medical world. Often a PT, because we will be seeing a child frequently, will sometimes be the person that's translating information and terminology for a family. They may come in and say, well, my doctor said this, I don't understand it. And I'll only catch a few words of what has been said, and then they'll translate it into something that maybe it wasn't intended to be. So therapists often are trying to translate that information. If there the information is, that's where we pick up the phone and we call those team members and say, there might be a misunderstanding. We need to figure out who does not understand what's going on with their child. So we're always trying to connect the dots so that the family has the best information and the best on the child's condition. Okay, next slide, please. So our expertise and our training in analyzing movement, why do people move the way that they do? And in analyzing that, what are their strengths? What are the building blocks? What's the foundation that I can build on to improve their movement? I'm doing that, I'm also picking up on, well, where are their weaknesses? What are the, the things that need to be strengthened? What are the things that are missing in their movement? What needs to be filled in? But I'm also really interested in this because that's what I'm gonna use as the base, the foundation to build on, to build these things that might be. And then motor learning. How do people learn to move? And this, this just fascinates me. I love this part. Um, it's very much how we learn in the classroom, right? And it's by a lot of repetition. But if I look at babies that are learning the first time, if you think about it, we don't remember that for ourselves. But if you think about it, when a child is learning to they accidentally do it by weight shifting. And they discover, oh my gosh, when I did that, not that they're coming through these things, but they discover when they rolled over, they see something different. Their environment changed. Oh my gosh, I'm different. So they want to repeat it over and over again. And when someone's learning a skill, that may be lost due to their injury. How do they do that? And so 
that's part of our training. How do we environment up for them to relearn a skill or to learn a new skill? How much practice do they need to do that environment? How, what kind of feedback do we need to give them so that they want to practice it again? All these parameters are really important. And then motor control, what constitutes controlled movement? Components that make up controlled movement. What skills are needed in order to have controlled movement? Some of you might be saying, well, it's so obvious. I mean, you have to have strength and you have to have, you have, to have the ability to, um, you know, extend your arm away from your body. And yes, those are all part of it. But at the very basic, I need to be able to hold my head up. I need to be able to hold my trunk up and I can't move my arms or legs, my body until I can do those two basic things. And then it gets more complicated from there. Last but not least on this, not every physical therapist wants to treat children. Um, <laughs> uh, I wish they did, but they don't. Um, and pediatrics is really a specialty area. And I always tell students that I work with at the university, a good sense of humor to work with kids. Um, some days can be really heartbreaking. Um, some days are absolutely yes, because kids are unpredictable and you never know what they're going to say. And they say some of the funniest things. Oh, they're funny but they are hilarious. So um, you need a good sense of humor. And if you're gonna be a therapist, no big time wrestling. All right, next slide. <laughs> so therapy and what kinds of, of um, conditions do we see? And really we see just about anything. So I've just things here. Developmental delay. This is a common diagnosis that we get. And this is why we have to be good at differential diagnosis. This is, is not a diagnosis. This is a diagnosis that if I submit that to insurance, insurance will say, we're not going to cover because this really isn't a diagnosis. Trauma, any kind of trauma. Injuries, it could be ankle, it could be um, a burn, it could be a number of different things. It could be an amputation, it could be a number of neurological cases, traumatic brain injury, uh, stroke. Children do have strokes. Sometimes they're in utero, sometimes they're after a, a number of things. And I just put et cetera there. Orthopedic cases could be rehabilitation after surgeries. It could be fractures, strains, um, a number of different kinds of orthopedic cases. Some of these might be genetic. Dementation disorder, which is a fascinating diagnosis. Um, I, I love treating these kids. Spinal cord injury. Um, Birth injuries, birth con uh, conditions that are congenital, herbs palsy, uh, tortoise, sports injuries, because children are getting involved in sports much earlier. And um, some of them are intense. And so kids are getting injured a lot in sports. And think about kids, for instance, they're getting repetitive use injuries, which we never used to see before. Dance and gender injuries, pediatric cancers, rare diseases, um, including neuromuscular diseases. This is very fascinating because if we look at um, two particular diseases like spinal muscular atrophy, 
Shen muscular dystrophy, both of which I'm involved in research with, these children are getting, for instance, many kids are being treated with microdystrophin now, gene therapy. And this is taking a child with Duchenne dystrophy and essentially changing the phenotype to Becker muscular dystrophy, which is a much less severe of muscular dystrophy. Kids with SMA getting gene therapy, changing from SMA type one to SMA two. SMA type one children without that would have passed away, would have died. SMA type two, some of those kids walk. So again, fascinating things, syndromes like Down syndrome um, and then autism spectrum just You can see that the range of diagnoses is quite large. And this is just, you know, sampling of what might come in office at Kids on the Move. Next slide. And that's it an overview of what's happening in the community and how important it is to be a team player, collaborate and reach beyond the office, reach beyond your expertise, make sure you know what everyone else is doing. Um, and so much by talking to other health professionals. Thank you so much, Dr. Senesak, for your presentation. Um, it's really interesting to learn about the importance of teamwork and advocacy in pediatric physical therapy and just the large variety of roles you serve in caring for the kids. Um, and so for our last Thank speaker, you. Oh, yes, of course, yeah. And for our last speaker of the night, we have Dr. Peter Sayeski, who is a professor at the UF College of Medicine and is also um, the Footprints Advisor. And we're so thankful for him and grateful for all of the support he gives to our organization. And it's honestly an honor to have him here tonight. And with that, I will let him take it away. Oh, thank you, Madison. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay. Um, anyhow, so I'm Peter Sayeski, and as Madison said, I'm the faculty advisor um, here for Footprints. And so I'm been in the College of Medicine about 21 years now, and I was approached about three years ago with Sammy Singer and Hannah Diosti asked me to be the, um, the advisor for the group, and so I'm happy to do it. And um, my role in the college is I teach and medical, dental, graduate PA students, um, you know, kind of do some research, a little bit of administration, but um, kind of these groups have kind of been near and dear to me, and I appreciate um, and kind of make it a little bit of a personal story. So it's funny as some of the things we heard tonight, it was, it was something along the lines of your Delta hand that you didn't anticipate or, you know, something that, um, actually does anyone recall what it was a very, and I, I, I should have written it down. What was the phrase that one of the, the speakers had said, but kind of your Delta and unexpected hand. And so in my case, it was my son's brain tumor. And so he, um, he was two at the time and it was, um, you know, very challenging and very hard, but, um, he is, his treatment is long. It, he's now 22. It continues. He had an MRI a couple months ago and it was very good and the results are good. So he's back in two more years, but, um, spent a lot of time in, in and off the fourth floor. And, and as Dr. Slayton pointed out, huge teams, he's had so many doctors and nurses and, you know, um, behavioral therapists and in, in a massive, massive amount of people that have been, um, uh, you know, treating him over the years and really the decades. And, um, but one of the things that's interesting that it's kind of relevant to all of you is that what's really important is all the time he spent in there. In fact, I, ironically, it was arts and medicine was the group because one of the other speakers had mentioned that. So I'm sitting here kind of going down memory lane in a way about this and getting a little bit emotional, but hopefully you'll pardon me. But um, so it was arts and medicine. And so my son was in the hospital quite a bit and they would come in and do different things. And so one day they would paint and they'd do this and do that. And so they asked if they could donate all the things that the kids would do, they would auction them off. And so um, they would be auctioned off for money and that money would go back into the program. And so I was kind of a knucklehead and I'd go to all these different auctions and all everything that my son had made, I, I, I would do the highest bids. And so a couple of my colleagues knew this, so they would actually just ramp up the price just to kind of like hose me in a way, but it was fun though. And so we had a great time. And so I'd pay, pay this insane amount of money for these things that my son, so here's one here, let's see if I can. You can see this. We what was this. Uh, where's the date? November eighth, two thousand five. Shan's fourth floor. This is when he painted this one. So, got paintings. Got 
got pots, <laughs> got all kinds of stuff. And so anyhow, the thing that I was accumulating all these things, and over time, what I started to do was to give these things out to family at Christmas and uh, presents like that. And so what it, as it turns out that, you know, again, all the people that Dr. Slayton talked about who to treat these kids and have treated my son. In fact, actually, Dr. Slayton has treated my son over the years. Um, you know, I don't want to say they come and go, but here as I walk through my house, the one thing that's very important and I see every day are these things. And so um, really, and that kind of, you know, circles back to what all you do. And um, I'm a very grateful parent. And just, just know that what you do is very important. And it, it's, it's not lost on anyone. I just want to say thank you. I just want to say thank you for that. It's really, it's really, really important. Please don't forget that. But thank you. Thank you so much for that, Dr. Sayeski. I think um, when you talk about it like that, it really shows how meaningful it is what we do. And it makes us feel so grateful to have, like, it's a privilege for us to be there um, for the families and the patients. So thank you so much for sharing that. It makes <laughs> me get emotional just to hear that. Um, so thank you again. And what a wonderful way to conclude our pediatric illness forum. We really appreciate everything you do for us. It would not be possible without you. Um, so thank you to all of our speakers who are here and thank you for everyone um, who came out tonight. We hope that you learned some valuable information about pediatric care and we truly appreciate you all coming. So thank you again and have a good night. And th thank you, Madison. Thank you, Kenna. Good, good night, everyone. <laughs>